line. What does it mean to age gracefully? It's an adventure, and I think that that's the best thing you can do. Don't shut yourself away, ever. You know, that won't help. Throwing the age-appropriate rule book out the window. It becomes important to myself because I want to feel good about myself. So I care about the image I see in the mirror yeah. every day more than I care what others may be saying or thinking. Then, the conversation every parent must have with their teen boys. That's what's frightening is most parents don't know what is going on online and they are getting something fed to them literally every 10 seconds. And later, how to nail your next job interview. I think the biggest piece of advice I could give someone is always reference back to the job description for the role you're applying to. Oh. It's a cheat sheet. It's City Life with Tracy Moore. colors today yeah you can sit down you're allowed now thank you. thank you for coming good morning now if you're the parent of a teen or you're just fascinated with what teens are up to today stay tuned for a chat with our friends Kat and Nat on mewing do you know what mewing is okay some of you do yes she's got it so we're gonna get into it and tell you all about it but first we are bringing you another episode of our new age series with iconic fashion journalist Jeannie Becker <laughs> Always good to so see you. to do this. Always so great to do this. Jeannie, this has been such an incredible series, and it just, every single time we come back in here and chat about this, it's a new and exciting angle. So who did you sit down with for this, this episode? I sat down with a true style slash fashion icon, mm -hmm. the legendary Zandra Rhodes. Mm -hmm. She is from the UK, um, came up around the same time that... Vivian Westwood did, with the, okay. the, the kind of a reverence in fashion. Uh, some say that maybe she was responsible for some of the punk stuff that we saw in, in fashion in the late 70s. But even back in the 60s, she was making her mark as a fabulous textile designer. Okay. What I love about Zandra, and she's got pink hair, bright pink hair, is that she is 83 and a half. <laughs> and she is still going strong. Okay. I mean, she's got this museum project where she's archiving all her fabulous old things and sharing them with the world. She's still doing collaborations. She was in Toronto not long ago for a collaboration with the shoe designer, mm -hmm. John Fluvog. Oh, cool. And they did a great, great a few shoes together. Anyway, she's just an inspiration. She has a great spirit and someone who is really um, adamant about expressing herself via mm. style and fashion, and I love that. Oh, I can't wait to see this conversation. So Xandra styled many celebrities, including Princess Diana and Freddie Mercury. That's just to name a few. So let's have a look at Jeannie's sit down with Dame Xandra Rhodes. <laughs> You have embraced the whole um, idea of aging with such a plomb. It's as though you're in a league of your own. Well, it goes with the product then, doesn't it? So <laughs> I like the pink hair and it goes with pink and green sneakers. When did you decide to be such an original or to have the confidence to be such an original? I think it really happened totally by accident. I mean, in the early 70s, Vidal Sassoon brought out coloured wigs. And I thought, oh, I'd like a colour wig. I'd, and I thought, well, why don't I dye my hair a colour? So I started to dye my hair green with ordinary dyes because I thought, well, sheep, it must be similar. So I did my hair green. The green came off on everything and it looked like old straw. <laughs> and then I went to China and I said, oh, red China. And I dyed my hair pink. And it's so easy to keep that it's pink forever. <laughs> Do you think people take advantage of the fact that fashion is the one creative exercise that we all get to practice every day? Do you think they really, you know, are creative enough when it comes to mixing it up? Well, when I go and get the tube in London and I'm the only one in colour, I wonder if they're creative at all because nearly everyone's in black, grey and um, some white. What are some of the most important lessons that uh, important young lessons. people should be keeping in mind as they go down that road? 
I always go out fully made up with my hair done. So that if I'm outside of the museum and I'm putting out the dustbins, the garbage bins, someone doesn't stop for a photograph and I look terrible. <laughs> uh, so always go out with, that, with makeup on. Um, I feel always to be encouraging. When would you say you first started really pushing those boundaries yourself? Really thinking, you know, against the grain, perhaps? I think that happened from when I first left college, where I was doing designs that no one would touch, that no one would buy. And then what's triply exciting now is the fact that the designs that we've got printed on all these wonderful multicolored sneakers are designs that I did in the 60s ah. of flying spacemen <laughs> and uh, little cars <laughs> and imaginary flowers. And it's everything coming to life again. Yeah, isn't that interesting? I'm ma mainly a textile designer that couldn't find a job. So my textiles have dictated the shape of all the garments because I started to make garments because no one would buy the prints. It also speaks of being ahead of one's time in a certain way, you know? Or living long enough to be in it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about how you were first approached to do a collab with John Flubach. I, ha I had a, an agent perform the miracle of getting us both together, which was fabulous, do you know what I mean? And it's great where there's a, a wonderful product that appreciates what I have to give to it, but everything he does is so original that it, it's like two original minds meeting each other. So just find that joy in relationships, both on a professional level with your creative collaborations and on a personal level. I guess that's what keeps you engaged. It and does, engaging. you know, I think it, it's, it's lovely. I'm lucky that my work and my pleasure seem to be able to mix quite well together. And one thing really feeds the other, it seems. I mean, you're so inspired by people. Yes, you know, definitely one's inspired by people and, and, and seeing things and doing things. It's an adventure, and I think that's the best thing you can do. Don't shut yourself away, ever. You know, that won't help. I just sit, shut myself away and then watch the TV. I wouldn't go anywhere. <laughs> what do you attribute that kind of um, optimism, let's call it maybe, or, or positivity to? I think if you're a designer, and especially in something as fleeting as, as fashion, the world goes up and down. So you can be up one minute and you can be down another. Now that doesn't mean you're totally down, it just means that you're not in the eyes of the public. But as long as I keep working and keep myself busy, I'm all right. But that's it. The fact that you have this fire within that makes you want to keep working. I mean, so many people, you know, I'm, I'm going to pack it in, you know, they turn 65 and that's just game over or something. Oh, I can't get old because I've got pink hair. So that's all right. <laughs> Yeah, the pink hair keeps you young, always. So inspiring to see Xandra uh, still working, yeah. collaborating, vibrant, doing her thing, yeah. standing in her power. So we are going to chat a little bit more about aging and style. So, of course, I got to bring in the wonderfully stylish personality that we have coming up. So she's the editor-in-chief and publisher of Zoomer magazine. And, oh, my goodness, does this woman do style. Please welcome <laughs> Suzanne Boyd, everyone. <laughs> Beautiful to see you. Beautiful to see you. It's a little floral no, situation. Nice. Come and have a seat. Usually I see Suzanne at events, so it's nice to have you here to uh, hang out with you on set. So I've got to ask you both this. How important is image as you age? Is it the sort of thing that's sort of like, well, I'm getting older, I don't care as much? I can tell that that's not the answer. But you tell me, how important is it for you, Jeannie? Well, I think, uh, you know, in some ways, it, it becomes increasingly important. Yeah. In other ways, it becomes decreasingly important. For me, personally, it becomes important to myself because I want to feel good about myself. So I care about the image I see in the mirror yeah. every day more than I care what others may be saying or thinking. Um, but, you know, does that come with age? Uh, probably some of those insecurities that I just want to make sure that I'm, you know, up to snuff and that I'm, I'm feeling, you know, right on my game. How about you, Suzanne? 
Yeah, I agree. I, you know, I think there's clothes. Yeah. And everyone here looks so beautiful. These jackets, I think it looks like a photo shoot. These bright colored I jackets. Know. I just can't. It's so good. It's so yes, stunning. Good for you. A rainbow. Well done. Very inspiring. Very nice. But I think there's clothes and then there's fashion. And yes. fashion is a point of view, it's a state of mind. And in that sense, it's a tool. And I think as you get older, if you're still in business or if you still want to feel a certain way, people judge you on your appearance and then image and fashion becomes important. Mm -hmm. But I agree with Jeannie, you, it's about how you feel. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's always been how I entertain myself, how I amuse myself. Yeah. I've used it as a tool in my career. So it's still as important to me as it always was yeah. and is and will continue to be. Has your style changed, Suzanne, as you've gotten older? Are you still wearing what you were wearing, let's say, or do you still have the same style you had 25 years ago? I still have the same style. Yeah. Um, I'm a bit of a pack rat, so I, mm -hmm. I pull out things like I've just pulled out a bag that I haven't worn for 20 years, and it's like, oh, that bag is good now. So Love that's what's it. great about fashion, it's cyclical. But for me, I've always dressed as to how I feel. Mm -hmm. So it's not about trends. I'm usually, I've been called a fashion victim. Really? My clothes have been laughed at, so I've just always worn what I felt like, yeah. and so that hasn't changed at all. Oh my gosh, there is nothing victim-y about anything you have ever worn. She always serves. It doesn't matter where you are. So let's talk about this whole thing. Uh, let's talk about style priorities. Have those changed for you, Jeannie, as you've gotten older? I think I have realized, because of all this education, you know, over the years, mm -hmm. of what, what clothes work, what clothes become more meaningful, that quality mm -hmm. um, is very important mm -hmm. um, and fit ultra important. So yeah. I am definitely of the attitude that less is more these days. Mm -hmm. And I really want to buy things that really make me feel good that I can hang on to and that fit, fit, fit yes. perfectly because mm -hmm. it's all in the fit. Back in the day, buying the $14.99 uh, tank tops yep. at Limite and Le Chateau to go to the club, oh. the yeah. Dave's are, they're over. <laughs> bad for the planet. It's ba over. bad for the planet. It's bad for the planet, but it's bad for my look. <laughs> it's not holding anything in, right? So you have to think yeah. about style, you have to think about fit, and yeah. I think that these are important things. We're going to continue this conversation after the break, so stay with us. We're staying with them. Yeah. Yes, we got more to talk about. Coming up, what does aging gracefully even mean? I think it's a, a, a bad concept because it's weaponized and you're judged. And later, hip hop pioneer Maestro Fresh West is in the house. in the spot today. Welcome back. We are continuing our conversation on women aging and personal style. We have Jeannie Becker here and Zoomer Magazine's Suzanne Boyd. Uh, I want to talk to you, Suzanne, about the perceptions of society. You say that you've been called a fashion victim. I don't see it. But are there things that you think we should stop wearing as we get older? Like, I still, I'm 49, I'm going to be 50 next year. Congratulations. I'm still, oh, thank you. I'm very happy to be alive. Very happy. And crop tops. You yes. saw me with my platform Uggs. Like Absolutely. I have a 13 year old fashion advisor, mm -hmm. a tween in my <laughs> yeah. home who's saying, no, you need a crew sock, yeah. mummy. Yeah. Like, are there things that you think that you should not wear as you get older? No, I don't believe that there's things you shouldn't wear as you get older. I think that goes hand in hand appropriate with this whole concept of aging gracefully. Yeah. Which I think is a, a, a bad concept because it's weaponized and you're judged. So I, I put it, you know, I always think about Madonna. And, you know, you look at men and women aging in the public eye. So someone like Iggy Pop, who always had his top off for years yeah. and still does it. And he doesn't look the same. Right. And people go, yay. But she's doing what she always did. And it's like, that's terrible. She's so vulgar. Why doesn't she, you know, stop doing it? So I think you have to do what's you. And if that doesn't change as you get older, then just do it. So if that's the crop top, the pop top, the short shorts. Yeah. There's ways to do it. You can wear, you know, if you want to have some sort of, let's say, camouflage. Yeah. There's styling tricks. So I, I say uh, my advice is just play with what you have. Mm -hmm. Tights are great with shorts. Um, you know, sort of opaque, slightly opaque beach cover-ups. If you want to do a swimsuit or a bikini, just any, there's ways to wear things, feel comfortable and still be who you are. I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's interesting, that idea of aging gracefully. What does that mean? What does it mean to be graceful when you age? Does it mean following the rules of society? 
or does it mean you feel good about yourself as the numbers stack up? I think it means to thine own self be true, yes. which is uh, the best advice you know, yes. I ever got. Yeah. Yes. And it has to do with authenticity. Yes. You know, and, and that, to me, is grace. I mean, really being mm -hmm. honest about who you are to yourself, first and yeah. foremost. Do you believe, Jeannie, in age-appropriate clothing? Um, yeah, um, because we've you know, thought, listen, we've had an evolution on the show as well. Yeah. We used to say, well, if you're over 35, yeah. no, yes. no shine on the eyes. Right. It's like those rules are kind of gone away now. You know, again, but... first and foremost, I believe in spirit appropriate dressing. Yeah. Like yeah. To, you, you have yeah. to dress for your spirit. Yeah. First and foremost, I, and it's a very personal thing, to, I have seen, you know, my body has, you know, changed over the years. So there's mm -hmm. certain... I still want to rock a mini skirt, but yes. with no fake tights. <laughs> but I definitely, yeah, exactly. right? But I definitely, you know, I, I don't know if I'm going to wear like you know the hip huggers and, and the, oh, the you know, expose my midriff and the little yes. bikini triangle yeah. bikini yes. with the low risers. But, no, but Jeannie. That's <laughs> I love I mean, that shot of you. It, yeah, well, I know. I was 17, darling. You I, were 17? Yeah, and I'm just on, I just turned 72. Yes. So, oh, you know, that wow. was a few uh, years ago. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I'm still uh, having fun with fashion. I still yeah. adore it. And I think we, as Suzanne was saying, it is a great tool yeah. um, to be used in, you know, very positive ways. What a great form of communication, mm -hmm. telling the world about who we are. Yeah. I love that. Um, Suzanne, I like mm -hmm. that you stay true to who you are. Um, both of you do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a fantastic message for people to even be taking on subliminally. Mm -hmm. Like, you're just living your life and you are yeah. doing what's good for you. So yes. keep going. Thank oh, you for that. Thank you. Um, Jeannie, <laughs> very exciting project on the horizon mm -hmm. for you. Uh, what's coming up? I've got a new book coming out with yes. Simon and Schuster. Uh, not till October, but you can pre-order it. Yeah. It's called Heart on My Sleeve, which is all about being honest and authentic. Um, and the subtitle is Stories from a Life Well-Worn, because it really is a, a collection of stories, and not in chronological order, but how certain items in my wardrobe from the past really... Um, act as springboards for incredible stories about life's adventures and the people that I've met and how certain things made us feel. I mean, we all have these pieces in our wardrobes, accessories, pieces of jewelry, garments, that really bring us back to certain mm -hmm. places in time and that yeah. teach us so much about mm -hmm. the way we were and who we've become. I love that. That's a good concept for a book. That's going to be That's incredible, so and we love that you are having this coming out, and we'll talk with you about it on the show again. You know that. Oh, Thanks so. to both of you for joining us today. We're going to take a quick break. we got more coming up, everyone. Stay with us. Coming up, parenting in uncharted waters. We're in a new generation where we're parenting from a place where we can't go on experience because we don't have the, we can't we call our moms and dads and say, hey, what did you do? City Lines Wellness Wednesdays is brought to you in partnership with Jameson Vitamins. For everyday immune support, Jameson is here for your health. Welcome back, everyone. What is the deal with teens mewing? And what's this trend really about? Spoiler, it's not about feline friends. Here to dive into the latest social media craze is Cat and Nat from internet fame um and also just two women i love so much so uh you're always on top of what's going on with the kids it's great to see you both what is mewing there she's doing it she's doing it it is a trend that boys are doing online and, and, and in real life yep and what they're trying to do is they're trying to bring definition to the jawline in order to make them look more masculine Okay. Like that's the serious, like, what's actually happening. They're sucking on their tongues and they're bringing it in. Mm. Now, our sons are all doing it just to be When, I, when sassy. I'm talking, just... So they're go. basically mm. outlining the jaw. Mm. jaw. And then saying, shh, I can't talk, yeah. I'm mewing. Mm. Because I'm so handsome, mm -hmm. check me out, Mom. We're like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> get over yourself. You're 12, sit down. Right? <laughs> okay, let's take a look at how it's done. We've got a, a couple of videos that will show you the kids doing it, not the moms. Mm. <laughs> oh, oh, whoa. Oh. 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 That's, that's a little extra? <laughs> that was extra. Okay, so th it's all about trying to chase a bit of perfection. Mm-hmm. Um, which 
is an interesting thing for us to be dealing with as parents because there has been a lot of attention on girls. Mm -hmm. And right now we're seeing boys who are into their hair, into their jaw definition, into their um, physical, yep. like their musculature, Bodies. like all of these things. So from a, you know, you look at it and you talk about it, it sounds silly and funny. Is there anything dangerous about it? Like what should parents know? Uh, it's so hard because I think sometimes we get into this red alert zone when we see one trend. Mm. And I do think it's a bigger picture we need to look at because I think most parents don't know what mewing is. Mm -hmm. And this will go and another one will come in, but it will be in the same genre of what are we missing around this conversation of the, the boys now all of a sudden being so focused on what we were so concerned about the girls. Now we have the boys in, in the same zone of worrying about what so hyper-focused on what they look like. And, mm -hmm. and if they're starting at 11 and 12, and we don't even know what they have seen before up until this point, it kind of goes into this, I mean, more toxic masculinity that we were trying to get rid of, and now we're back in almost too far again. And, and so much of what they're trying to do is because they're watching other people do it, and it's unrealistic. Yeah. And then it can become a problem. Okay, so at some point we were trying to get the girls to a place where they were caring less about how they looked. Yes. They stayed there and now the boys met them. Yeah. Yep. Like that's not what we wanted. No. We wanted both to go back to like maybe, you know, focusing on what's happening inside your body and how you deal with other people and are you empathetic and all these things. So Kat, you mentioned this. Um, there's sort of, there, this trend's gonna go away and another one's gonna come in, but there's sort of an umbrella that we need to be looking at. And the umbrella is looks maxing. Mm -hmm. So it's this whole thing, it's all about being very, going very extreme to be very masculine. Could be steroids, could be plastic surgery, could be something called starve maxing, which is what? Where you don't eat, so you can get more muscles. Anorexia. So yeah. yeah. Really? It's really, they're just like, it's a fancy name for muscle definition. Eating disorder mm -hmm. and anorexia. Yeah, disorder eating, 100%, yeah. What about breaking bones on purpose? <gasps> In order to change the look of your face or the look Ooh. of your body, which is so extra. And that isn't what most of them are doing, but there is yeah. a percentage that are. And it's just, it's the pressure that um, boys are now feeling because they're seeing so many examples of guys trying to teach them, if you do this, you'll be more masculine, you'll get the girls. And our girls have been dealing with this before and yeah. forever and ever, but the boys were sort of ignored. So now we're finally bringing a little bit more awareness that the that the boys are having a hard time too, and they're having a lot of struggles. And think mm -hmm. about all the girls we talk about. Their, we talk about how to talk about their bodies and to them from a very young age. Yes. Where boys, we sort of have we where the narrative's not there yet. So we're yes. it's sort of we're in a new generation where we're parenting from a place where we can't draw an experience because we don't have the we can't we call our moms and dads and say, hey, no. what did you do? We didn't live it. So now we're having to scramble. And that's what's frightening is most parents don't know what is going on online and mm -hmm. they are getting something fed to them literally every 10 seconds. Yes. Yes. So it's like, mm, mm, mm. How do we, so how do we go about then talking to them about things like mewing and starve maxing and looks maxing and all of, all of these things? What, are, like, what would you say is, what well, do you do? What do you, you do? You know what I do. What Stop do you talking. Do? Throw them in a car. Yeah. <laughs> pick up like carpool somewhere. Get yeah. all like, be like, I'll drive. Do it in the dark. Yeah. And then you, you, what comes out of their mouths, I don't know how they think you're not there, but I think just being present amongst them rather than, we have a problem. Do you know what mewing yeah, is? Yeah, Sit yeah, down. Yeah. We, you can't do yeah. it like and, and when they're in the car, for some reason, it's like they all want to hear their own voices. And they all want to have an opinion. So they're all just like shooting stuff. They're not even listening to each other. Mm -hmm. But you as the driver are taking it all in. And every once in a while, feel the right moment and just send in a really gentle question. How do you feel? Like, how does that make you feel? Something that they're, they, they think you're just part of the conversation. Yeah. And then you'll get things out. But really it's like inquire without, what's this called? Um, yeah, the lecture. lecture. The yeah. lecture. And yes. when in doubt at the dinner table, just do it to them and see <laughs> yes. what they do. Let them like, know oh, you know. You know yes. Once you steal the trend, they're yes. like, oh, it's over. It's over. It's Mom over. knows. Yes. Yeah, Mom yeah. Knows. When, yeah. They, when I was talking to them about it or I was showing them the trend, they're like, you know that? Yeah, yeah. you're like, watch And me. I'm like, yeah, 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 I know it. I try and be all cash about yeah. everything, but really it's like my eyes are like <laughs> bugging out of my head. Inside, yeah. I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, act natural. But it's like act natural and also like, 
as the driver in the car with the carpool, I'm listening to everything, mm -hmm. So, but I also feel like I can't bring it up later because mm -hmm. then they know I was listening to everything. No, yes. they, you know, um, teenagers love to be their own ex. They love to be the expert. Yeah. Like, they want to be right. So just inquire rather than tell them. Be like, right. oh my, have you seen this? Like, uh, they'll eye roll you, but then they'll tell you their full opinion on it, usually. Yes. And I think you have a problem if there is one part of the bigger puzzle. Right? Are they yeah. are they not going to to the pool because they, they don't like the way they look? Are they same things? Are as they not girls. eating for two weeks before they go on vacation yeah. so they have oh abs? Are they go, are they going to the gym for three hours a day? Like yes. what? Where is the dentist saying that their teeth are moving because they've been Doing mewing too for much. too long? They, and I yeah, like most are sort of like mm. it's yeah. once it's there, it's gone. Totally. You know, once you know about it, it's happened. I've been asking the questions uh, in my fake casual way. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, just to see what their take is on it. Is this something yeah. that they're taking seriously? And so far, they've both been very dismissive about, they're just like, oh, this is so, so stupid, Mom. It's just dumb. You know, this is what we do, and it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. So I think that's probably good to keep checking in. Yes. Right? Yes, because things it, could change at any the, time. Things can it's change. It's going to be something next week. So just, yeah, right. be, in, be in tune with where they're at in their lives. Don't turn a blind eye. Is there anything that you're trying trying to do to limit their um, social media because I feel like the train left the station yeah. and then it's really hard to get it back in. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> you know, I think that it's knowing their algorithm. I think that's your, your biggest thing. Mm. And send them videos that you want them to watch, yeah. and then that will become their algorithm. That's <gasps> just a quick hack. So. Math videos it is. Yeah, you, li, li, yeah <laughs> you just talk a lot about positive things, and then that will start cut. Literally. Because if you check theirs and you check their algorithm, it's a lot of the same stuff. You're like, how did this even get here? Because they watched it, and they got more yeah. and more. This just is a great tip, send guys. Send videos. This is and then, parenting hacks from yes, Kat and Nat. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks to both of you. Keep the conversation going at home, everyone. Let's go to break. That's a smart idea. So I send a lot of jobs. Coming up, what are you doing wrong in job interviews? Biggest mistake is that people are really scared to shout out their accomplishments loudly, especially women. We're really bad at owning the stuff we're great at. Welcome back to our gorgeous audience over there. Uh, listen, layoffs seem to be dominating the headlines lately. It's all we're hearing about, and landing a job in today's market is tough. But today we are chatting with a career recruiter about what you need to know to land the job of your dreams. Please welcome Emily Durham. <laughs> I am a fan favorite. Follow this woman on Instagram. She's got, or on TikTok. You're all over the Thank place. You. You've got so many people following you, and it's because your advice is so golden. So welcome to CityLine. Thank you for having me. I'm so, so excited happy. to be here. So um, you are Emily the Recruiter on social media, and you help millions of people with their career problems. I want to talk about the most common mistakes people are making when they're looking for a new job. What are we doing wrong? Oh, we're doing a lot wrong. We're doing a lot right, and let's start there. I yeah. think the biggest mistake is that people are really scared to shout out their accomplishments loudly, especially mm. women. We're really bad at owning the stuff we're great at. Yep. That mindset shift is probably the most important. Yeah. The next is um, we need to make sure we speak the right amount. So undersharing is actually a huge detriment to us in interviews. It's okay to, you know, boast about the work that we're doing in a really structured and, you know, simple way. Um, speaking and communicating really clearly about yeah. what's important to us is going to be the most important thing. Okay. Um, and, like, is there anything that we're, like, are we leaving important things out when we are being interviewed? We're leaving a lot out. I think the biggest piece of advice I could give someone is always reference back to the job description for the role you're applying to. Oh. It's a cheat sheet. They're basically laying out ex everything that you need to be, like, shouting and exclaiming in the interview. Yeah. As long as you're pulling from there, you're good to go. I love that. Okay, so we're actually going to help one CityLine viewer level up her interview skills. Let's meet Samantha. Hi, I'm Samantha Ozuduk. Since September of 2022, I've been applying for jobs. Um, I'm trying to leverage my five years of health and safety experience while making a pivot into HR. Um, I've also been doing networking conferences and applying to, across both sectors. Um, I have yet to secure an offer and then also I have too much experience for being a specialist, but then also not quite enough um, without any direct reports from management. CityLine, can you please help me? Yes, we can. We actually <laughs> brought Emily here to help you, but Samantha's here. Give her some love. Hi, Samantha. Hi. You know, 
It's already nerve-wracking going to an interview, but now we're making you interview on television. I'm so sorry, but it's going to be so worth it for you, okay? That's all right. I'm so excited. Let's do a little interview. Emily will be here to guide you, and then you're going to get all the answers perfect from when you do your actual interview in real life. Is that cool? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to be the potential employer. <laughs> Wouldn't she want me to give you a job? <laughs> she looks friendly. Okay, I'm gonna start with this. Samantha, tell me about yourself. Uh, so I have a successful five-year career in, in health and safety, and I'm currently pivoting into HR. Um, I've also like noticed in my job search that the positions I'm applying for in terms of like, specialists, I have too much experience, whereas for management, I've never had direct reports. So that's kind of what's getting me as well. Okay. Emily, what do we think of this answer? Shall I tap in? First of all, love that you've already prepared this. I'd say my biggest piece of advice, don't write a script, give bullet points. You want to make sure that we're still having personality, we still show up as ourselves. Recipe for success when it comes to the best intro is a sandwich of information. It's two sentences for who you are, two sentences for what you do, two sentences for what you want. So I would actually eliminate the language on what's been hard in the job search. Let's not worry about the past. You're focused on the beautiful thing in front of you. And she wants to give you this job. So let's focus on really selling what we have. Let's not worry about what hasn't worked previously. And using that sandwich, perfect way to get there. Oh, I like that advice. Okay. Uh, Samantha, what are your biggest strengths and weaknesses? Uh, so my biggest strength would be health and safety because I have had a career within that. Um, in terms of my weaknesses, it would be more with like Excel. So with, like the harder Excel stuff, like the V lookups and pivot tables. Um, but I do try to improve that because I actually like go out and research and then I also tap into the person in the company who's very good um, with Excel as well. Okay, and what about your personality strengths and weaknesses? Because that's good when it comes to software programs, but how about Samantha as a person? Uh, so in terms of, like, I'm really good at building trust in my people skills, so I get people to reveal, like, very confidential information easily because I have worked up that trust with them. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of, like, weaknesses, I do tend to take on too much work. Okay, so I'm, I'm happy you said that. This is one that gets people stuck all the time because what do you give as a weakness? What are your thoughts on the answer? Great question. Okay, let's start off with what's not. A good question, yeah. weaknesses. It's 2024. Why are we asking what people's weaknesses are? Right? It is. Like, I don't know. I know. I know. Leave me alone. Okay? Leave me alone. Call me pretty, say I'm smart. It's very simple. <laughs> First of all, red flag. If an employer is asking you that, side eye. Lazy, do better. Here's what I'm going <laughs> to at the end of this. Um, here's what I'm going to say. You have um, an awesome set of examples and experiences, especially for your strengths. So my biggest recommendation for strengths, go back to the job description, find two or three things they've listed, make those your strengths. We're not going to lie. We're just going to, we're going to make it a little glittery. We're going to call out what we know they want. When it comes to the weaknesses, recipe for success, I love an answer sandwich. Mm -hmm. Start off with something that's honest. So it's Excel, it's data, it's whatever's not working then I want you to give a specific example of how you overcome it. So you're not going to say, oh. I'm a perfectionist, girl. Everybody says that, right? right? We're all perfectionists. But if you say, I'm not great with data, here's how I actively every single day get better with it. What are they going to do? Stop you for learning? So give them no reason to walk away with concern. Mm, love it. Okay. Samantha, why are you looking for a job right now? Uh, so I'm actually looking for a job because my former position ended up changing into facilities management. And then also just like the pandemic has been a catalyst for change and I'm trying to get into the human resources side. You're free to call me a jerk for asking that question. <laughs> that was dumb. I wouldn't like, have come on. it, but I would work for you, so it's fine. Okay, it's fine. Yes. all right, it's fine. What do you think of the answer? <laughs> okay, amazing. So here's what I'll say. I think you are calling out all the right things. You're being honest and transparent. Just as much as Tracy's interviewing you, you're interviewing her. So you mm. don't want to work at a company that's going to make you feel uncomfortable for your life and your experience. Yep. So that's a win. What I'd also say, if we want to take it to the next level, let's add what you're looking for. Like, I know you didn't ask, but you can always say, you know, I had some role changes, didn't really feel like a fit now that the position evolved. Here's why I love this job. Um, and this is why I think this is my next step. Just to make sure we're always leaving it with a sweetener of, God, you can't get enough of me, can you? Mm -hmm. And that's really the energy that we want to bring to that interview. Love it. All right, Samantha, uh, what are your salary expectations? Um, so typically I would ask the range, but obviously since we're in like a, a such a different situation, I can't. So um, I do look at the salary, the market ranges online. So I know depending on the positions I'm applying for, it's roughly like 70 to 95K. So that's somewhere where I would like target. 
What would you do with that? Would you try and give way more than you want to be earning? Or what's the strategy with a salary expectation? It's so hard because you can price yourself out of a job so easily, right? Yeah. You can put yourself a little lower, a little higher. Suddenly they think you're not qualified or they think you're overqualified. Mm -hmm. Best thing to do, always put it back on the recruiter. Play a little dumb. Well, I wasn't super actively looking, but I saw this position. It's so interesting. Can you tell me a little bit more about what your range is? If they really can't give it, you're doing the right thing by you know, doing your research online. I love websites like Payscale, Glassdoor. They have pretty accurate data for years of experience. Um, but what I would recommend saying is, say, here's the minimum number I'd be willing to start talking about. Don't give them an upper ceiling. You're um, now telling them the bare minimum you're willing to accept, yeah. and you're obviously going to add 15% to that number, right? So if you Good. want 70, <laughs> suddenly it's 85 and a nice handbag. Um, so yeah. you want to make sure you're always inflating. Price yourself up. Add a little bit of tax. Oh, I love it. Samantha, what do you think? Was that helpful? Yes. It was Thank helpful you very for me. Much. Yeah, Thank you. Anytime. That was awesome. All right, let's go to break. We got more coming up. Stay with us. Coming up, hip hop legend Maestro Fresh West on the state of the genre. Back in the days, it was just like a, a thought. Yeah. And people thought it was like like a, just a fact. But to see hip hop transcend uh, generations, that was a beautiful thing. Welcome back. I'm so excited about this one. My next guest is a legend who is not done making his mark. Watch this. They call him the godfather of Canadian hip hop, and for good reason. His debut was a game changer. This jam is amplified, so just glide. glide. Looking at your backbone, slide. slide. Maestro Fresh West has truly set the bar high ever since. Thanks for having us. You know we do. Snagging the very first Juno Award for Rap Recording of the Year. My lyrics are awesome and tune in volume and bloom and I'm blossoming. Fast forward. And he's making history again this year as the first hip hop artist to enter the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. And then a top Canadian honor, the Governor General's Performing Arts Awards for Lifetime Artistic Achievement. His influence is undeniable. Please welcome the one and only Maestro Beautiful. Oh, no, I love you. So good to have you. Have a seat. How's everybody doing? This is a long overdue hangout. I mean, we now we have to do it on TV, but that's okay. Because yeah. I get to see you and we get to talk. We're so <laughs> proud of you. Congratulations. You. you were doing incredible. Thank you. What does it feel like to have this induction into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame? It feels great, man. We started from the bottom, but now we're here doing international things. You know, yes. before back in the days, it was just like a, a thought. Yeah. And people thought it was like like a, just a fad, but to see hip hop transcend uh, generations like is a beautiful thing. You know? Do you like? Does it feel good to you to be getting your props from all of the artists that are making their way out into the world now that have started in Canada? Like they all always bring it back to you. How does that feel? I feel great because when you my reference points are like LL Cool J. Yes. You know my reference points are Run DMC. Uh -huh. You know even before that like like Sugar Hill Gang, Rappers Delight. Do you see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So to see this genre of music that celebrated its 50th anniversary last year yeah. um, still be celebrated, but specifically in Toronto right here with me being inducted and being the first hip-hop artist inducted in the Canadian Music Hall of Fame, yeah. to me, that, that, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it is a beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah. But long overdue, wouldn't you say? I'll be honest with you. If I was just to think of... Of I didn't get this or I didn't get that, I wouldn't be doing all these things that I've been doing. True. It, right? True. That's a liability. A lot of times our ego is a liability to our growth. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I hear what you're saying, and you're absolutely so right. So I never stress not getting the stuff earlier. Yeah. Because it look, look what it I, happened when it was supposed it to happen. It happened when it was supposed to happen, man. You That's know? okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, you have a new album just dropped. Yep. So it's Rap Prime Minister, which, by the way, we're going to be looking for a Prime Minister <laughs> very soon. Would you ever think about politics? Is nah, that something? Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> all jokes aside, I think there's other ways that I could be an asset to my community without, you know, politics. Yes. Yeah. And um, I'm just thrilled to, the, I don't even know if you know this yet, man, but um, I got the Maestro Fresh West Scholarship. And that's for yes. specifically for black youth interested in learning skilled trades because we don't have a shortage of, of uh, rappers, but we definitely got a shortage of black youth 
interested in learning the skilled trades. And if we don't learn how to use yeah. our hands, we're always going to be dependent on people. If we're always dependent on people, we're always going to be on slave mode. So mm -hmm. to me, these accolades are great, but if I could do something to help the next generation coming up, that's dope. You know? Can we hear it for the trades? You're yeah. absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. So I love that you have, you know, diversified. You're everywhere now, and you're actually even in the kitchen. So let's talk <laughs> about season two of your show, Maestro Chef West. Like, I want you to come on in and bring the food. Yes, but yes, But I want to yes. talk about how you made this jump into uh, into this show. Yeah, man. Shout out to um, Lachlan O. Chet Wesley with three of the producers of Maestro Chef West. We're in season good. two. Yeah. And before even that, I want to say a big shout out to superstar celebrity chef. Latoya Fagan, man. Yes. A twist catering, yes, man. Absolutely. You know this what I'm is saying? all from Twist Catering. Yeah, man. Latoya is a star. Yeah. She's done our show before. We love her. She's fabulous. Why was food an interest for you? Well, you know what it was? Well, first of all, I, I gotta eat, right? We all gotta eat, you gotta right? Eat. But two, at the same time, you know, it was like producing my first television project that I'm actually a producer and not just a okay. host. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. This was a good avenue for me to, to start, you know, expanding my brand. Yes. You see what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Because we gotta eat, I thought it'd be something cool to do. And I saw Snoop and Martha Stewart, right? I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Snoop's my dog, he's my guy, right? I said, like, wait a minute. I'm the maestro chef West, and I don't make burgers. I make backbone sliders. You know oh, what I'm saying? I love it. You see what I'm saying? So the wheels yeah. are turning. But yeah. that's kind of cool, right? But yeah. hip hop was the foundation. Yes. And from that, I was able to, to, to transcend professionally. You've done some acting as well. Yeah, man. So yeah. how do you, like, when you're an artist, you're a musician, but you're also in television production, you're producing, um, and then you're also doing some acting on the side. Like, yeah. how do all of these different lanes work together? Like, are they all feeding a different part of who you are? Yes, exactly. So the Maestro Chef West stands for longevity, mm -hmm. perseverance, and Canadian heritage. Those are the three things that, mm. that um, my brand is about. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So longevity... That doesn't mean you have a, one hit that in the 80s and it's a wrap. Yeah. You got to continue going through different generations, right? Yeah. On um, perseverance, there's peaks and valleys. That's why I wrote the song Stick to Your Vision. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and Canadian heritage, that's, that's self-explanatory. Yes. You know what I mean? And um, so born in Toronto, raised in Toronto. I live in New Brunswick now. I know. You know? And, How's uh, that? How's East Coast man. living? Beautiful. Shout out to Tourism New Brunswick. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's, it's beautiful, man. It's beautiful. I live in St. John. And, uh, yeah, Very man. nice. Okay, so we, we gave a shout-out to LaToya, but do yeah. you know what we have here? Yeah, like, we got some Alfredo. So we've got some Alfredo. Yeah. Is it like jerk Alfredo? Exactly. So we brought a little Toronto with a little East Coast. Very nice. And then also we have uh, tacos. But what kind of tacos are those? These are cot, pepper cot tacos, mm. man. Yeah, yeah. Okay, pepper cot tacos. Yeah, man. Very nice. You go ahead and take a bite, and I'll do the talking with my mouth full. Congratulations <laughs> on all the incredible work. Season two of Maestro Chef West streaming now. Give it up for the one and only Maestro Fresh West. We're going to break. Stay with us. We're going. My bibliophile friends uh, will want to listen up right now because it's time for our March pick for the City Line Book Club. And it is Never Been Better by Leanne Tashiko Simpson. Leanne's debut, debut novel is about a bipolar woman's search for love at a seaside wedding. It's an offbeat comedy about secrets between friends and the realities of living with mental illness. It is handled so well. And to help you read along with us, everyone in the audience is going to take home a copy. You see that? Take home a copy of the book and enjoy. The only reason I'm talking right now is because his mouth was still full. But I'm still with Maestro, and we're enjoying the show, the food. And that's the end of the show. The amount of info on the show today, was that not incredible? Cat and Matt, thank you, Maestro. Thank you, Emily Jerem. Thank you, Ginny Becker. Thank you, Suzanne Boyd. Thank you, everyone at home. Thank you, all.